Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar, uh, or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, it's uh, my pleasure. We're really excited here today to have this webinar and share uh, about uh, data privacy and Prop 24 with you. Um, today, uh, we're going to have a webinar that's about 45 minutes in length. Uh, I encourage you, if you have questions, uh, to raise your hand and present them uh, directly to me. I'm Steve, your host, uh, in the chat window, or you can email questions directly to hello at stevetow.com. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to bring Alistair McTaggart to this webinar. Uh, Alistair is board chair and founder of Californians for Consumer Privacy. Uh, Alistair is a developer who's been building housing in the Bay Area for, for over 20 years. Um, he believes that all Californians and people worldwide should have the fundamental right to data privacy and be able to control their own personal information. Uh, he, he has led important privacy initiatives throughout the state of California. And in 2018, one of those became the strongest privacy law uh, that the uh, state of California has seen, known as the California Consumers Privacy Act. Uh, today, uh, Alistair will be talking about Prop 24, uh, California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, what it means for the privacy of Californians, uh, children's privacy, and the future of privacy in the United States. So uh, thanks again for joining, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Alistair. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to, to join. I'm really excited about uh, this webinar, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, you will be too about uh, all the good things that Prop 24 will bring to Californians um, and to your own personal life. So let me uh, share the screen here and we'll start walking through a, uh, uh, here we go. And okay. So I'm gonna, uh, thank you. This is a, the Prop on, uh, Yes on 24 webinar. There's my disclaimer on the, on the bottom right. And uh, go down here. So here's uh, the, the plan for this morning. We're just gonna uh, basically talk a little bit about CCPA. Steve mentioned that, that's the existing law, the California Consumer Privacy Act. We'll talk about uh, the new one, CPRA, how it was, uh, how, the timeline of developing it, and then it, we'll talk about its major features, and then we'll conclude. My presentation shouldn't take more than 20 minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for questions. So with that, just kind of thought I would start with reminding all of us you know, why, why we're all interested in this area, why so many Americans uh, and Californians are really uh, thinking about this whole subject. And the term commercial surveillance, I think it comes from Shoshana Zuboff, she's a professor at Harvard. Uh, this is really something that we're all now very aware of, uh, that wherever we're going, we're being tracked. And this is a brand new thing, right? It didn't, ex it didn't exist up till about 10 years ago where we started carrying around these phones uh, and communicating all the time. And, you know, we have these devices in our homes, on our wrists, in our cars. And, you know, all this data is flowing into these aggregators that are capable now of really changing our lives by the information they present back to us and uh, kind of shaping our lives. So that's, that's the context in which all this exists. And as I like to say to, you know, people, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, Standard, Standard Oil was a very powerful corporation, but it didn't know everything about you. Uh, and these companies are powerful and they know everything about you. It, this is a brand new thing that we've, we've really never seen in, in human society before. Uh, there's a new Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma. And for those of you who haven't seen it, even if you're a privacy professional, you think you know it all, I, I'd urge you to see it because it really, it, it, it presents things visually in a way that really kind of resonates, I think. Uh, and it reminds us all that this is not just a, this isn't just a problem that's confined to, you know, is your, is the thing you were searching for falling around online. There, there are profound implications for society and especially for a democracy. So let's talk about CCPA and uh, the, this was uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. And this was, uh, how did I get into this in the first place? And, and how did this all come to be? So in of 2015, I sort of had the idea that data privacy might be an area some, you know, that would be good for an initiative because clearly these corporations are really powerful and they've, they were success, had been successful in stopping any real privacy law from uh, taking effect anywhere in the country. And I spent a couple of years researching it. I, I hired a very small team, one, one person, and uh, you know, uh, really sp spent a lot of time trying to talk to anybody, experts, uh, who would, who would uh, talk to me. 
And so we filed the initiative at the end of 2017. Uh, and that winter we gathered the signatures. Uh, we needed uh, about 366,000. We gathered over 600,000, which was at the time more registered voters in California than there are people in Wyoming or Vermont. Um, that was right as soon as we started gathering the signatures and, and showed we were serious. That's when the opposition committee formed a couple of years ago. And it, it was really an uh, eye opening time because literally everybody in technology joined. Uh, this is just a partial list of the, of the things. All the car companies joined, because when you think about it, they're increasingly just data companies, insurance companies, everybody joined. Um, and the market cap of the, at one point, when I calculated it, at one point was over $6 trillion against us. And then this happened, which we'll all remember. Um, this is when things changed for me kind of personally, because uh, my friends went from being like, what are you doing with your time to, oh, I get it, there's that thing. Um, you know, Facebook pulled out of the opposition. They sort of were, we embarrassed them into doing that. Um, and, uh, and then something happened, which I hadn't expected or even known could happen, where the uh, legislature, I started talking to uh, these two gentlemen here, Assembly Member Chow on the left and Senator Hertzberg on the right. And in a, you know, this life is just always so random and crazy. It turns out that Hertzberg knew my college roommate really well. And so I think he understood that, you know, he could do a deal. I was someone who could, you know, be worked with, whatever. And so uh, we spent four months negotiating. And I went from like, there's just no way we'll ever do a deal because these guys will never agree to anything that I would agree to, to um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we got a compromise that I think really was a, one of the best compromises I've ever heard of. We essentially took the private right of action and limited it to just data breach, which was a big deal for the for, for industry. In return, we got a way better, more comprehensive set of uh, privacy rights than were in the ballot initiative. We got the right to see your actual information. That wasn't in the initiative. We got the right to delete your information. We got extra protection for kids. You know, we got some really major improvements. Um, so I was thrilled with, uh, with the deal that we got in, out of the legislature. And um, it passed unanimously with like three hours to go. That afternoon was when we had to decide whether to uh, withdraw it from the ballot. The governor signed it. And just to recall, you know, refresh people what it does, sort of the three main rights are the right to know what information a business has collected about you, the right to say no to its sale, um, and then, you know, the, the right to really have it kept safe. If, if they're going to collect this information about me or my kids, they should keep it safe. Um, and so then let's talk about Prop 24, which is on uh, this November's ballot. <clears throat> I think, you know, the first question is, people always ask, well, you just did this. Why, why, are, we, why are we doing this again? And I think for me, um, the really eye-opening time was last year in the legislature. Uh, Perhaps naively, I, I assumed in 2018 when the thing passed, okay, well, you know, now this is the law, maybe there'll be efforts to improve it in certain areas or you know, change in certain areas, but this is now the law. And I came to realize pretty early on in 2019 that, uh, that business and industry, they looked at this just as a speed bump. And they came in in January of 2019 uh, and just with sort of massive efforts to just gut wholesale portions of the law which was sort of breathtaking. I mean, there was a bill to just remove all insurance companies from, uh, from the scope of the bill. There was a, remo a bill to remove all vehicle data. There were two bills to remove uh, restrictions on behavioral advertising. And that's a fancy way for saying tracking you everywhere you go so that they can, you know, these businesses can watch you from site to site, from your device to your car, to your partner's devices, to your you know, home in-home devices. And, gather all that data and then advertise to you across all that. Uh, and that was sort of like, wow, these people are just trying to get rid of this law immediately. Uh, forget letting it go into effect and see how it goes. They, they just want to get rid of it. Um, and so that led me to think, you know, there's going to need to be some kind of uh, backstop here because, you know, on one side you have multi-trillion dollars co corporations and on the other side you really have, you know, very few uh, privacy advocates. And I think it's worth, uh, for those people who are not Californians uh, who are watching, who don't necessarily know about initiative law, in California, 
there are two separate law uh, systems of law. There's the initiative law and there's legislative law that comes out of Sacramento. And it's really interesting. The initiative law was created by a guy named uh, Hiram Johnson in the early part of the uh, 20th century in response to this realization, he was the governor and he realized, look, this, I can't get anything through Sacramento because the mining companies and the railway companies own Sacramento. It's actually a fascinating story. His father was part of that really powerful cabal of politicians that were in the, in the, in the hold of these companies. And he thought, you know, we need to, a way to get citizen democracy back. So he created this initiative law. And the reality is you cannot, uh, you can't amend an initiative. The legislature can't amend an initiative uh, unless the initiative tells the legislature it can amend it. So it makes some sense that the priority of the voters, the, the, the power of the voters is supreme. And so our thought with Prop 24 is let's create a floor for privacy. And what the, what the initiative basically says is uh, the legislature can amend it with a simple majority going forward. So we don't, we're not, we're not uh, trying to constrain the, the role of the legislature. The only thing we say is that you cannot have any laws in the future that harm consumer privacy. Now, a lot of initiatives say the legislature can't amend and then, or they'll say you need three quarter vote in both houses. And this is such a fundamentally, I'm, I'm spending time on this area because it's really an important part of this law almost the most important part of the law, if it passes, is that it would create a floor in California for, for privacy so that you wouldn't have attempts to do what on the left-hand side of this, of this slide, you'd be able to say, no, if you take all insurance companies out of the scope of privacy, uh, that's not good for consumer privacy. Uh, you know, because right now this is just a law. They can come back next January and vote it out of existence. This would ensure that this, I almost think of it as a new human right privacy would continue to exist in California. Um, absent somebody doing a different initiative. So that's a really important part that I, that I, if there's one takeaway, it's that the main goal is not to constrain uh, where this goes in the future. It's a complicated area. There will need to be changes, technology changes, societal expectations change. And uh, this gives flexibility to the legislature to amend. There's some other reasons. You know, Europe, 500 million people have what I call first world privacy because GDPR is, is more comprehensive. We in California deserve that same level of privacy. I think if California passes a strong comprehensive law that's gonna be there for the foreseeable future, that will absolutely help other states and or the country to get a good privacy law. And then I think really now is the time. People want this, you know, this is our polling from a couple of months ago. We, we you know, show the, our ballot title and summary and, and, and we had you know, really strong support for, uh, for that. So, in terms of the timeline, we, we did work on this last year. It, we tried, my first thought was to do it in the legislature and Senator Hersberg did try, but it just, it's, there's no ability to get anything big like this done. Even the small little fixes we tried to get done, uh, you know, done in CCPA were, 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 were hard or didn't get done. Uh, when we filed it in September, we then had a, an amendment period where we, we went up and talked to as many people as, as we could. We had just hundreds of conversations with, with various folks about ways to improve it. And so we filed a final version in uh, middle of November, began getting the signatures. And, you know, we got uh, this time because the number of signatures required is um, tied to the gubernatorial uh, elections. We needed 620,000 signatures and we almost got a million. Uh, so now it's more than five states or, or DC. And these are all registered voters who signed this. Um, and that's the largest privacy drive in US history by a long shot. Um, and again, you know, it always seems to come down to the last minute, but uh, because of coronavirus at the end, it was hard to get the signatures. And so Riverside County was 15 minutes late turning in their signatures and it was a long convoluted process, but we, uh, we made the ballot on the, on, the, on the next to last day we could make the ballot. Um, and so we're on the ballot in November. So what does is, what is, uh, Prop 24 do? In, in addition to creating a floor for privacy, what would it do if, if, if it's enacted? Uh, you know, the first, let, I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of big parts and then I'll go through some of, this, of the, of the uh, additional ones more quickly. But this one, this, this concept of a new category of sensitive personal information and giving you a new right to stop the use of that data. So in CCPA, you have the right to see it and the right to delete it and the right to stop the sale. But this is, 
importing a concept from GDPR in Europe. This is saying, hey, look, no, there's some information that's so valuable, so, so sensitive to me, that I should be able to stop you using it unless you need it to deliver the product that I'm asking for. So my, you know, my health information, my genetic information, my biometric information, my religion, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity. And so the way to think about that is, you know, Uber doesn't need to know my race to give me a car. Uh, now, and, and then a lot of like the, the weather app doesn't need to know exactly where I'm standing. And that part of it, it's almost a part I like most of this is, is part of uh, sensitive personal information is your precise geolocation. And what this lets you say is, uh, if the law goes into effect, there's a circle around you, roughly 250 acres. And so the business will be able to know, okay, they're an LA resident or a Sacramento resident, but doesn't need to know exactly whether you're at the gym or at the fast food restaurant or driving to see your friend or, you know, standing beside someone who's got a criminal record, whatever. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it gives you some anonymity, which is so important in this day and age when they're literally tracking which room of which house you're in. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of kids, we, we really, uh, ramp up the fines for violations involving kids data. We triple those fines and we require opt-in consent in order to sell the personal data from consumers under, under 16. One of the parts that I, um, am most excited about is enforcement, uh, and it, uh, the effectiveness enforcement, let me say, uh, the, I feel for the attorney general because in CCPA, uh, the law gives the attorney general of California enforcement uh, authority and responsibility. And he is, I think, not, un, not, not uh, I understand his, his concerns. He's kind of put his hand up and said, look, we're, we're cops, not regulators. Um, and I, I don't really have the funds to do very many um, uh, enforcement actions in a year. And so one of the things that, if you look at the, what the agency would do, the first thing is it's funded without any, it's just funded by the state's general fund at, at 10 million a year, that's indexed. Remember that California had an Office of Privacy Protection and it was disbanded by Governor Brown in 2012 uh, with, due to budget cuts. And right now, you, every year, the Attorney General gets appropriated money to, for, for, for privacy enforcement. So that's gonna be subject to all the annual appropriation fights. Uh, and I think that's not the way to run something that is that we, at least in my vision, needs to be consistent and needs to be uh, there protecting California. Um, so the current, right now, the, the AG this year got 4.6 million from the legislature and has hired 23 employees with, with that money for privacy. Uh, so 10 million would equal 50 employees. And that's just to kind of put it in context, the FTC for privacy enforcement for the entire country has 40. Now it's interesting, 50 people, 50 employees, you know, some people say, oh, it's not nearly enough. These are trillion dollar companies. And other people say, wow, it's way too expensive. So I think we're, we, we arrived at the right place. Um, and, and importantly, I think that it's not just a uh, enforcement authority. It's also a guidance authority. It's the place that business can go and say, hey, is this a practice okay? Um, and, and also it'll get the consistency where you won't have the swings between administrations if someone's really a you know, not, not, not concerned about privacy and someone else is super concerned about privacy. This gets you more consistency in terms of regulation. And then, you know, other benefits. Uh, so these, I have now a whole list of things that um, are, these are just things that are not in CCPA. Many of them are, are come from European GDPR. Uh, so purpose limitation is, tell me what you're gonna do with my information and only use it for that purpose. Storage limitation. Tell me how long you're gonna keep my information and don't keep it any longer. Data minimization. That thing that you said you were gonna use my information for, okay. But don't collect more information than you need it. So I wanna hear music in my car, uh, so I want my phone to sync up to the car. You don't have to suck down every single one of my contacts, uh, which is what they do, by the way. <laughs> don't, don't sync your contacts with, the, with, with your car. <laughs> uh, the uh, chain of custody. Um, if you were gonna share or sell my information, you have to make sure that the business receiving it also has to offer the same level of protection to me. And think about what that means. That means there's no little game playing where you go out of state and then you're not covered anymore, right? That's a, that's a huge new right compared to CCPA. Um, 
there's a new requirement for, 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 for reasonable security, for good security. Right now, there isn't that requirement in the CCPA. Uh, and think about what that means in terms of what, you know, oh, now you can't use my uh, second I mean, two-factor authentication number for marketing, stuff like that, right? It, it, the, the consequences are, are, are many of this. Uh, deletion expansion. If uh, I tell you to delete my information, you have to be in a position to be able to tell all the businesses that you've shared that information with that they also have to delete it and they have to delete it. So think about that from a contractual point of view. That just means now that there's, again, that's the other side of the chain of custody. That means that really you can't just send this stuff willy nilly, my personal information and sort of be done with it once it's left your business. No, you have to actually be able to trace it because um, it's important that again, that the rights that I enjoy now are not lost just because you send it to some other business. There's a new right of correction. There's a new right to see all of my personal information when I ask for an access request, not just the last 12 months. So CCPA is just the last 12 months of information. Profiling, I probably should have this on its own slide because the more I think about it, especially in today's you know, uh, context, uh, even since November, you know, what's happened in society, how important this, this is. So Europe has this concept, which we imported, where, you know, if I'm subject to automated decision-making, I should be able to object. And that includes profiling. So are you the business creating a profile about me? And then I should also have the right to know, to learn meaningful information about the logic involved in that algorithm that is creating that profile about me. So am I only seeing certain jobs because of my health status or because of my education status, my work status, or my race or ethnicity? Uh, these are, uh, as you think about a world where these platforms are, are really curating your existence, this is a really powerful concept. And the ability to object to it is, I think, going to become more and more important uh, as we go forward here. In terms of enforcement, right now, CCPA has a 30-day right to cure, which is essentially is two strikes are out. And so we removed that, and now it's more like a speeding ticket. If you're caught, you're, you're uh, violating the law, you're liable. Now, there is language saying that the um, regulator can take into account the voluntary efforts of the company. And so if the company shows up and discloses voluntarily a, uh, uh, a, a problem, there's, there's language saying, suggesting that the regulator can uh, uh, treat, the, treat the company better than if it discovers it itself. This new, uh, uh, we have a new term called cross-contact behavioral advertising. And there is a weakness right now in, C in CCPA, unfortunately, in the definition of service provider. Uh, but this is really the notion that the, the giant data aggregators, which are, are tracking whether you're logged in or not, whether you're a member or not, are tracking your online behavior from your car to your you know, wearable device, to your phone, to your desktop, to your kids and your, you know, everybody in your family. And they're assembling this really very rich picture of you. Uh, and so what we sort of uh, give the person the power to do is opt out of all that gathering so that you're really, again, in a one-to-one -one relationship with the businesses you're doing business with. Um, and uh, there's a requirement for annual cybersecurity audits of these big uh, processors, data processors. Uh, also annual risk assessments, you know, should I be really gathering this information and processing it? Um, there's an appointment of a chief privacy auditor to audit businesses for compliance with the CPRA. And then uh, one thing to note is, is uh, I think it's important to think about these fines because these fines, as we saw with a $5 billion Facebook fine, they can be large fines. And we're, you know, I know that's for the country, but, you know, we're a 40 million person, fifth largest economy in the world, bigger than most European countries. So, so the, the fines could be also extraordinarily large here. Uh, what, what we structured is that the excess fines, that the fines first go to repay the cost of the, of the agency, but the excess fines get deposited into a consumer privacy fund and think of it like a sovereign wealth fund, the interest from that goes back to the general fund. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I think just coming back to the point that I, that I really think is almost central to this whole initiative is this would prevent the law being weakened in the future. Um, 
but allow full flexibility going forward to amend it in any way that doesn't hurt consumer privacy. If you go to our website, uh, you will see this fancy uh, chart. And it really, I mean, the, the CPRA columns, there's two of them sort of side by side here. Uh, what you see basically is we, one way of thinking about this uh, is that we harmonize this law of GDPR in Europe. And, and that was overtly kind of uh, the intention. Uh, and just on that, the reason I didn't do that in 2018, good, bad, or indifferent, was I thought we would be fighting an election campaign in November of that year, and with no privacy law on the books of any substance, I thought if we, if we asked for a, a small number of limited things, it would be harder for business to say, these people are gonna you know, destroy the world, the, the, the sky's gonna fall. Uh, now that we have that base, and now the privacy has moved so much in the last couple of years, I think now is the time to say, hey, you're doing it in Europe. There are 500 million people, you can do it here. Uh, you know, my concluding thoughts are, this is just another uh, episode of consumer regulation. Uh, and it's a little disappointing to me in, 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 as, a, as a business person that so many businesses aren't sort of seizing this uh, proactively and saying, yeah, we, we understand it. Because think about like the episodes with auto safety, how much the car companies fought it. And yet now, if you tried to sell a car without ABS brakes or, or, or an airbag or something, the consumer just wouldn't buy it. And the car companies are still making money. Uh, tobacco, smoking, no one really thinks we should have, you know, go back to an era of vending machines in, in uh, you know, high schools. And then in the 70s, you know, especially in this state, you know, we led the way with the clean air uh, and the cars and continue to lead the way. Uh, and again, there was a lot of pushback from, the, from, the, from business. And then it turns out that actually, no, uh, the world is better with cleaner air and cleaner water and uh, business still survives. I think this is exactly the same with privacy, right? There's initially like, oh, you're gonna kill the golden goose. You're, you know, you're trying to regulate away all the great things in the internet. And the answer is no, I'm a business person. You know, clearly the internet is one of the most spectacular inventions in human history. Uh, and the, the notion that I can have the, all the libraries of the world at my fingertips is an extraordinary benefit. So I'm, I'm certainly not anti-technology, but I do think that the time is uh, ripe for regulation around what happens to our own personal information. Um, and I, I have this phrase uh, uh, about the data curtain. You know, I'm old enough to remember what was up when the diet, when the iron curtain was, you know, uh, across Europe, there was, there really were two kind of uh, worlds. There was a world where you had personal freedom and a world where you did not. And, um, and now if you look at countries like China, uh, this information is, it's never been as easy to control a population as it is now to monitor a population as it is now. And, you know, we spent a lot of time pointing at the Chinese government, less time actually thinking about, what's happening in this country, you know, the, these, these, these businesses that have access to all this data, uh, you know, in terms of a, a, a countries in the world, I think in terms of revenue, Apple's sort of 15 in terms of countries of the world budgets, uh, Microsoft and Google are 26 and 27. And I don't want to criticize Apple because I think of all the big companies and actually Microsoft, they're really, they're really privacy forward. They extended, both of those companies extended CCPA rights to the entire country, uh, didn't have to. Um, but I think when I think about why I'm staying involved here, it's really because as a society, this technology has the potential to upend the balance of power between the people and the government, uh, between the people and, and corporations. And I think it's important that we get that back, uh, that we readjust that balance. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. I will just say that we have a tremendous amount of uh, support. So Andrew Yang is the, char is the chair of our, of our uh, advisory board now, Representative Khanna, we've got the state controller. We have, we have a quarter of the California State Senate who's endorsed it. We have a bunch of assembly, assembly people, uh, Common Sense Media, uh, Consumer Watchdog, NAACP, lots of labor support, the firefighters, the, the, the building extraction trades, ask me. So uh, we're really gratified that so many people um, have come out to support it. Many of the privacy experts, Shoshana Zuboff, Roger McNamee, uh, uh, you know, Chris Hufnagel is a professor at Berkeley. And um, uh, so I hope you'll vote yes. 
uh, on 24 when you see it on the ballot. And I hope you'll tell people to vote yes. And with that, I will, I think, take my screen sharing off and uh, turn it back over to uh, Steve. Thank you, Alistair. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I hope everybody uh, attending enjoyed it as well. Uh, just a, a quick update, a quick note. Uh, I see a few hands raised and we received a lot of questions and we only have about uh, 10 minutes or so to, to fit your questions in. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, but if you wanna send your question to hello at stevetout.com, uh, I'll share these questions with Alistair and uh, he can optionally follow up with you offline. Uh, so I welcome all those. Um, Alistair, you know, personally from me, I wanna thank you for your commitment to privacy. I think this is one where you, you, you don't know what you have until it's gone and we see it eroding every day. Uh, and just a reminder, I have a reminder every day how privacy is the foundation of our freedom, our economic and political freedom, and is a cornerstone of uh, uh, vibrant uh, democracies. Um, so, you know, on behalf of uh, colleagues and friends uh, and myself, thank you for this commitment and your contribution to privacy. Uh, first question is from Bob. How are similar campaigns progressing in other states? Pretty simple question, Bob. Uh, two years ago, we passed CCPA in the state, and to date, no other state has passed anything close to it. Nevada did pass it, a sort of general privacy law that's not nearly as strong. New York, uh, Senator Thomas has been trying to do something there, hasn't gotten anywhere there. Uh, Washington now has tried twice uh, to get something done. And so the answer is nobody's close right now. And can you put your forecasting uh, eyeglasses on? What is the impact going to be nationally? What, what does that look like to you? Well, what was interesting is I spent a lot of time in Congress uh, at, in 2018. I testified a couple of times. And when I would meet members, they would all say the same thing. Look, for 25 years, business has been in our offices saying, don't, you know, don't mess with the golden goose. Self-regulation is the best regulation. You don't understand how important this stuff is and you're too stupid to regulate us. And as soon as California passed, they're in the same office as saying, hey, we need preemption now. And overtly, we need weaker preemption, you know, than, than California. One of the reasons I'm excited to do the initiative is I think it's materially different if we as Californians can walk into our representative's office in, in Congress. And remember, we're 20% from California of the House Democratic majority. And we can walk into those offices and we have the speaker uh, and we have the minority leader and we can say, look, X you know, 100,000 people in your district voted for this, don't mess with, you know, don't let it be gutted. So I, I think that the impact will be large. Thank you for that. Uh, question from Rocio, I think I have, I hope I, think I, I, hope I got that name right. Uh, two part question, uh, does Prop 24 need a majority vote to advance? And if Prop 24 gets a majority vote, uh, will it take effect immediately? It only needs a majority. Uh, so 50 plus one of, in the election. And it does not take effect immediately. There's a transition to uh, this commission for rulemaking, but the actual Prop 24 takes place, uh, takes effect on January 1st, 2023. And the notion there was to give it some time to develop the rules. Uh, the rulemaking took longer than I had expected between, you know, when it passed in June, 2018, they, the rules weren't finalized till just like, you know, two months ago here. So uh, it, it takes a while to get rules through the state. A question from Yadi. Um, why is the criteria on minimum number of contacts increasing from 50,000 to 100,000? And is this a, a change of definition to business? Yes, Yadi, it is a change of definition. One of the, one of the uh, uh, in the original ballot initiative, the criteria for whether you were covered or not by the law was, did you sell more than 100,000 people's information a year. There were two other, there was a, a revenue test and a what, what percent of your sales came from uh, selling information. But that, that middle test of, of how many records you were selling a year, that got changed in the legislative you know, deal we did. And they stuck in buy or sell, they lowered 100,000 to 50,000, but not wasn't just buy or sell, then they, 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 they added these two phrases, receives for a commercial purpose or shares for a commercial purpose. And one of the pieces of you know, feedback we heard last year from a lot of small businesses was like, hey, this is not good for us because now if I'm a small florist and I'm not uh, selling your information, but I'm actually running your credit card, I'm actually receiving your personal information for a commercial purpose. 
So we're going back, we're making it cleaner. We go back up to the original definition that was in the original ballot of 100,000 a year. And we just, it's clean. Are you buying or selling information? And the reason for that is, you know, go where the problem is. The problem actually is not the small little shop selling knives or, you know, knitting wool or whatever. The problem is these, these companies that are, and they don't, they're not all big, but the data brokers and the companies that are, you know, collecting and buying and selling your information, that's, that's the problem. So that's where we're, we're, we're aiming at, at going. Thank you. Uh, question from AJ. A AJ. Uh, will Prop 24 erode the right to delete? No, uh, on the contrary, you know, what's, what, what happened is, is uh, we create a new definition for what's called security and integrity. And that's been portrayed as, as weakening. It actually, uh, the, the right to delete got a lot stronger. So let me just explain the, the, the exemption here. You, you as a business don't have to delete information of people you think are fraudsters, essentially. Because if this person's a fraudster, you actually want to remember, hey, that person's a bad guy. Uh, we added something saying, and by the way, if they've, if they're physically dangerous, so like, let's think of you've rented to a vacation rental or to an Uber driver, it's the guy assaulted an Uber driver. You want to also be able to say, you can't delete your data because I want to make sure you never log, you know, you never become a member again. Uh, and we added the European definition for security integrity. So that's all we did there. But the right to deletion got a lot stronger because now as I said earlier, when you tell a company to delete, it has to be in a position to tell every company that it shared the information with to also delete your information. And that does not exist now. So it's, it got way stronger. There's a follow-up to this question, uh, Alistair. Uh, will the prop in CCP protection on biometrics such as DNA or fingerprints? No, also something that is being misportrayed. Good question. Uh, first of all, uh, because biometrics is now part of your sensitive personal information, you have a brand new right to say, don't use my SPI, my sensitive personal information. That includes your biometrics. So that's not in, so that's, a, first of all, a huge new right. We changed the definition of biometrics to say when it's used or intended to be used to identify someone. And the reason for that is, let me give you an example. You don't want to be in a position where you're making business collect more information about you in order to comply with the law. So if I'm walking through a mall and the security camera is taking a picture of my face, you don't want to be in a position where you're requiring the mall to install facial recognition software on its security feed to be able to respond to my request if I go to them and say, do you have a picture of me? Right now, if they don't have FR software, they'd be like, no, we don't know. And you, that's what, that's what you actually, that's more privacy protective. You want to keep it that way. So, so SPI, so biometrics should only be when it's used or intended to be used. Uh, to identify you. Otherwise, it, you, you end up creating a much worse problem. Yeah, I see. Uh, so question from Tom. Uh, would Prop 24 let businesses promote digital redlining? Now, this is something the opposition is, is, is uh, raising, which is just a, a head scratcher to me because it's the opposite. And, and if, Alistair, can I maybe add, can, can you explain briefly what digital redlining is and sure. then expound on it? So digital redlining is, uh, the old redlining is you do it, the banks would draw a, a red line around a neighborhood and say, we're not going to lend to people in, the, in that neighborhood. The new digital redlining is, you know, we're going to create a profile of people that we're not going to lend to. And it could be based on race. It could be based on location. It could be based on activity. Uh, you know, and the activity could be, oh, you're around too many people who have a criminal record, you know. You spend too much of every day, and we know that because we're looking at your phone and other people's phones. So think about it. Now, you would have a right to say, well, you can't ever track me to within 250 acres, so you never know who I'm standing next to. You don't know who my roommates are. Uh, you, you can't use my race or my ethnicity. So if that's the metric on which you're digitally redlining, I now have power that I don't have under CCPA. Uh, and by the way, the profiling, the automated decision-making, you can't do that either. So now you can't just reject me for a loan because of some criteria that's not, ex not explicable to me. Now you're going to have to explain to me why you did. And this gets back to real fairness, I think, in, in, in lending. In a so. slippery slope, you know, once you start, you know, where does it end and et cetera. Uh, I have a question uh, and then we'll wrap up with, a, you know, just, uh, you know, a qu couple questions about enforcement. Um, you know, does the CPRA reduce your protections out of state? 
How does that work? Yeah, no, it's, it's, this is also crazy. Another thing the opposition is saying, but we have in the law a dormant commerce clause, and there are two aspects to that. One is if you're a California, you go to New York City, and someone collects information about you in New York City, and the whole activity takes place outside of New York, outside of California, and there's no storing or the data that never enters California. That is, uh, we as California cannot be in the position where we're trying to regulate that or we'll be thrown out in federal court. That's called the dormant commerce clause. The other, which they're criticizing us, is a corollary to that. If you're wearing your Fitbit and it's collecting your information and you're in Sacramento, but you don't have an uplink uh, to the internet, then you drive to Reno. In Reno, that Fitbit uploads its data. We also in California can't be in the position of saying that the activity of the upload in Reno is prohibited. But because the information was collected in California, all that information is protected by the California law. So this is all just smoke. These people are throwing stuff at the wall to see if anything sticks, but, it, but absolutely not. Every protection that is afforded to you as a Californian is as, as robust in CPRA as in CCPA. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a parent. Uh, I think a lot of us are, you know, maybe on this uh, webinar, um, and children's privacy is of great importance to, to those with kids. So walk me through the fines that businesses should have associated with violations to children's privacy. Well, so right now in, in the law, the fines are 2,500 for non-children and 7,500 for intentional violations. And what we did is, you know, just even in the two years since, uh, since uh, uh, this past, you know, we saw the, the, the YouTube a fine, uh, just under $200 million. Uh, the the, the, the uh, news about the Google Play Store really just routinely ignoring, you know, kind of COPPA. Um, my kids are online now all the time, as I'm sure all the people who have kids are, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the profiles being created about them. And I, I was literally joking with my wife the other day is like, if my kid who's 10 screws up on an assessment, is he not going to get a job when he's 22? Because they're going to be like, well, you know, when he was 10, he wasn't that smart, right? Yeah. Um, and it's kind of terrifying. So what we say here is, you know, uh, that the fines for kids are, are just in, in their own category and it's 7,500 per uh, kid. And we really want businesses. And one of the other cool things about the law is it, I didn't mention this, but it requires the regulator to create a standard where uh, the, the, the consumer can easily, you know, take advantage of it to indicate to businesses that this is a kid. And so think about how great that would be if, if you're a parent and you just push a button and then everybody is now warned that that device belongs to a kid and you can't mess with their privacy. I would love that. And that's one of the things that this law does. It says, hey, regular, go out and develop that standard and then require businesses to comply with it. And uh, one final question, uh, Alistair, uh, walk me through what the CPRA proposes in terms of the agency that would be created if passed. So it's uh, uh, a five-person commission uh, who are not paid, but they're just given a per diem. And I think of that really model on the FTC commission. Uh, and then they would hire, uh, a, you know, the, 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 the executive director, I suppose, of this, of this agency. And the agency would be, a, I think, a, 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 a permanent privacy protection agency. And what people don't think about when they think about Europe, they think GDPR is like one law, but actually it's, enforced by agencies in the different countries. Well, I think kind of from a standing start, this agency would be the most powerful privacy agency in the world because it would be the only real agency in this country with teeth. And it would, like we do so often in California, it would set the standard and set the direction for, for privacy. So I think, you know, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. It would, uh, it would be a, it have a just outsized impact because it would be at some level representing 300 million people here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very excited about this part of it because then I think you have certainty. And I think actually it's good for business and good for consumers that you know that this is going to be consistent and going to be there. Well, you know, I'm excited about this. I, you know, what I've, uh, the research I've done, it looks like that CPRA would give Californians, uh, uh, you know, upwards of 90% uh, parity with the GDPR. So that's really great progress. Again, thank you, Alistair, for this work and your team's work and your investment to make this happen. Uh, as we wrap up here, can you share any final remarks that you have, uh, you know, summary of your thoughts and, um, you know, any final asks uh, that you have of the attendees? Sure. And let me just correct you. We're well, not correct you. 
add one thing, the only major right that the GDPR has that we don't hear is this right to be forgotten. And that's just a First Amendment situation in this country. It's very, very difficult to, 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 to think about that ha happening here. I think, you know, my concluding remarks are, you know, when I got into privacy, I, I thought, my initial thought is, oh, I should have a freedom of information analog and be able to find out what these companies know about me. Uh, it is since morphed to think that, like, I don't want to sound too dramatic here, but I really do think that the, 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 the texture of our society, what it looks like over the next hundred years, what it becomes is, is really at stake here because if you think about wiretapping laws, you know, the telephone invented in the 19th century, it wasn't until Hoover was finally out of office in 72 that we had finally good wiretapping laws. Imagine if you thought to yourself, gosh, the telephone company can listen to everything I'm saying and use it to build up a data about a profile about me. Everybody would be like, this is terrible. And yet that's what's happening in this world of data. And we're just kind of been the frogs in the pot being, being boiled. We need to get power back. That doesn't mean that these businesses are bad. They're in many respects, fabulous businesses that have reinvented the world and allowed communication and allowed a, a tremendous number of good things. And the consequences are also not good in some other areas. So we need to preserve the good things and, and, and regulate the, the, the bad things away or, or make sure that we as uh, as Americans have, have new rights with respect to these businesses. Otherwise, our democracy is at stake at some point because if I know everything about you and if I can get you to do something and you don't even know you're doing it because of what I'm doing, that is a tremendous amount of power that we've never seen before. An abusive society. power, <laughs> that's abusive. Like being in an abusive relationship. At some point, I don't, I don't have evidence that the, that the companies are, are necessarily doing it now. Uh, I don't wanna suggest that, I'm not saying that. But if you think about what the what the current administration has shown, all these things we thought were laws turned out not to be. You know, mm -hmm. it turned out that the person could do a lot of stuff that you thought they couldn't do. You know, that that power that we, you know, that these companies aren't using right now, they could at some point use. And so I think it's time to. Sh it's, this is an opportunity to shut the barn door before the horse is left. And uh, I'm really excited about this, this this opportunity for California. So everyone should vote yes for 24, Prop 24. I hope that's what they're going to do. How, how can they get in touch with your organization, uh, your website? Uh... Yeah, caprivacy.org. Okay. And you can contact us there. And uh, you can volunteer for the campaign. You can contribute. You can educate yourself, educate others. Uh, and uh, we'll take any and all help. And, and, and uh, so, so thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I have uh, appreciate your patience and your participation. And um, good luck, Alistair, and nice chatting with you, and um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.